Hi, uh, welcome everyone. You're on uh, Radio Panic and you're listening to Le Mur à des Oreilles, uh, Conversation pour la Palestine, or in English, The World Has Ears, Conversations for Palestine. Yes, indeed, this month again, we'll be speaking English. We are uh, recording on October 22nd from the Brussels National Theatre, where our guest today, um, Israeli historian and professor Ilan Pape, will be uh, talking tonight as part of the series of events set up by Le Festival des Libertés. Good afternoon, Professor Ilan. Good afternoon. Happy to be here. And indeed, we are very happy to have you on the show, and thank you very much for giving us an hour in, um, in the middle of what I imagine is going to be some busy days. Um, Ilan, you are a um, historian. You've published numerous books, uh, amongst which the famous and controversial for some people, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine in 2006. And in 2007, you moved to England, where you are currently uh, teaching history at the Exeter University. Um, you are part of uh, what is called by some people the new historians who give a fresh analysis and, and a new narrative of the uh, history of Zionism and the creation of the state of Israel. Um, you've taken some radical positions against the state of Israel. And um, why and maybe when did you decide to stand on the Palestinian side? And um, how has it been for you uh, being an Israeli? Yes. Um, it's changing uh, one's point of view on such crucial issues uh, is a long journey. It doesn't happen in one day, and it doesn't happen because of one event. Uh, I've tried in one of my books called Out of the Frame uh, to describe this journey out of Zionism into a critical position towards Zionism. But if I would have to choose... Uh, a formative event that uh, really um, changed my point of view in a dramatic way. It was the uh, Israeli attack on Lebanon in 1982. Because for us who grew up in Israel, this was the first uh, non-consensual war. This was the first war that obviously was a war of choice. Israel was not attacked. Israel attacked. Uh, and. Um, when this later on was followed by the first uh, uprising, the first intifada, for people like myself who had already some doubts about Zionism, about uh, the historical version, we learned at school this, these events were uh, eye-openers in many ways. Um, it's, a it's a long journey because of the second thing that you have said, because um, once you take the journey, you are facing your own society, you're facing your own family, even. Uh, and uh, it's not a pleasant uh, position to be in. And I think that uh, those of you who know Israel know that uh, it's a very uh, intimate society and a very uh, vibrant society. So um, uh, if you are against it, you feel it in every uh, aspect of life. And I think that's one of the reasons that for people like me, it takes a bit longer uh, eventually to come to the point where you say there's no no return you have to subscribe to these views whatever the uh, repercussions are okay thank you uh frank hello you're here too Hi, uh, how are you i'm very well very happy to be with uh ilan yourself and the family i guess um <laughs> I, I think it's very interesting um you know what you're saying about israel because people don't realize i mean most i guess nation states now are very Propagand propagandist and uh, and uh, but Israel is e even more peculiar in this way and goes even further. Um, I know uh, someone that you know as well, Nurit Peled Elahan, has written a book um, about the way Arabs are portrayed in Israeli school books mm -hmm. to show the world that actually the uh, amount of brainwashing and, and propaganda in Israel starts from a very very early age. She was also telling me that her, one of her son. Uh, even if he was born in a leftist family, anti-occupation family, had a very hard time when he had to choose to do the army or not, even though you know his parents were completely opposed to it. Um, can you tell us more about this? Because you experienced you, know, you experience this, uh, this yourself as well. Indeed. It's a very indoctrinated society, probably more than most uh, Western societies. 
and more than the non-Western societies because it's uh, self-indoctrinated in a sense that uh, it's not because of coercion that people are indoctrinated. It's uh, a powerful indoctrination from the moment you are born to the moment you die. And um, they don't expect you to get out of it, actually, because you you seem to be swimming in this fluid. And uh, uh, what uh, Nurit El-Hanan Pellet says, uh, both in her book and through her life, is indeed this, this very uh, thing that uh, uh, it's almost like a religious person who becomes really an atheist. And he still believes that maybe God is there and maybe he will punish him, punish you for being sacrilegious and so on. I think it's, one should think about it in a similar way, that you you were brought up to believe that this, these are such basic truisms of life, that if you challenge them, uh, you need to clean yourself up to the bottom to be sure that you are able to move on, because otherwise you have all these doubts all the time, because it was so powerful. Um, but I think there's a difference between my generation and the present generation of uh, Nurit's sons and my own sons. They know more than we did. And because of the internet and because of what goes on, I think it's more difficult for the Israelis now uh, to rely just on uh, indoctrination, although they're doing a good job, one should say. I mean, there are very few among the young people in Israel who challenge Zionism. But... Um, I think that, I hope at least, uh, that uh, the world has become too open. I mean, uh, that's what happened in the Arab world as well. You thought that these are closed societies, wouldn't know what goes on and so on. Uh, so I think that, uh, again, I hope or I think that this is going uh, to change. But for us, we were like in a bubble. We didn't know there was a different existence. And uh, it was very, very difficult to uh, get out of it. I guess yeah, the the older generation, uh, you know, not sort of the, the your generation, the one of uh, of p- the people like Nurit. Uh, I mean, the amount of I guess, you know, cognitive dissonance as well. You know, when you, you've believed in something so strongly all your life, you know, even though I think the fact uh, shows after a while that you're wrong, it's it, it's just so hard for you to actually. Uh, you know, accept that you were wrong for, let's say, 30, 40 years of your life. And, and you see this, um, you know, all, all the time, you know, in, at events, when you see always the same people coming to every single Palestinian event. You know, you, you, I always think, I mean, they know as much as I do about Palestine, and they know it's facts. How come they're still defending Israel that strongly? And I think because this is such a, a personal and emotional journey that it's very hard for them to to just come to the realization that, yes, they were wrong, and all their life, in a way, has been a, a myth. Um, yeah. Yes, I, I think we should also uh, point out that, um, like in any colonialist situation, where you have an anti-colonialist uh, struggle, there's a lot of violence in the air. So when you are brought up in a certain way, and the policies or actions of your own government um, uh, push the other side to take some violent actions as well, then you think that objectively your point of view is correct because you see there are suicide bombers, there's violence, there are missile attacks from Gaza. So we have to also understand that this um, need to get out is being uh, debated and examined within the context of permanent violence. And uh, it's very difficult for Israelis, I think, to uh, separate between the violence that they experience and the reasons for that violence. It's very, very difficult. I mean, one of the most difficult things is to explain to the Israelis what is the cause and what is the effect, what brings this violence about, and not to regard this violence as just coming out of the blue, and therefore they have no choice but to be the way they are. I mean, that's a problem uh, of uh, also knowledge and, and education, I guess. And also, I think it comes uh, from the fact that mainstream media or, or the education system, is, I mean, in Israel even more, is, is not doing its job. You know, when you hear people here, uh, I mean, even Europeans, not non-Israelis, uh, saying, look, what do you want Israel to do? Hamas is, uh, has been sending 150 rockets a day to, to Zderot. They have to 
they have to react. You know, I think we live in a, in a time where history is only short term and, and very, very short term, actually. It's not, we're not talking about six months, we're talking about last week. And, and then, yeah, as you said, the cycle of violence, uh, violence is, will never stop because the job is not done, the educational part is not done. Th that's true, and I think one of the major challenges is to find space uh, for Israelis and Western uh, people to be able to understand how it all began, in the sense that even the first Zionist settlers, when they came and realized that what they thought was an empty land, or at least their own land, was full of other people, they regarded these people as aliens, as violent aliens, who took over the land. And, and it is this infrastructure that they have built about the other side that feeds all the Israeli uh, perceptions and visions. It's a dehumanization of the Palestinians that begins in the late 19th century. And uh, th how to explain to people that they're actually a product of these uh, alienations and these uh, kind of defamation, if you want even, of the Palestinians is one of the biggest tasks for anyone who is engage, engages in uh, alternative education or trying to convey a different message to the Israeli Jewish society. And I guess that's what, that's what your job has been about, going back into history, studying the facts and the archives. And so going back in, in history, uh, people, I mean, I guess the educated uh, on the subject people think the conflict started in 48 and with pretty much, you know, the Holocaust. Some people will say the conflict started in 67. But I'd like you to, because I know you've, you've studied this a lot, to talk about what actually historically has, was the first Palestinian intifada of the late 30s, you know, 1936, and the, um, and the revolt against mostly UK imperialism and also Zionist uh, huge immigration. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to, to go back to even earlier than 1936 in order to understand 1936. Uh, you have to go back to the late 19th century when Zionism appeared as a movement that had two noble um, uh, objectives, if you want. One was to find a safe place for Jews who felt insecure in the an atmos a growing atmosphere of anti-Semitism, and uh, also, and this was also noble and acceptable, that uh, some Jews wanted to redefine themselves as a national group, not just as a religion. The problem started when they chose uh, Palestine as a territory in which to implement these two uh, impulses. And um, they, it was clear that because the land was inhabited, that you would have to do it by force. Uh, and you had to, uh, in a way, contemplate the depopulation of the inhabitants, of the indigenous uh, people. And it takes time for the Palestinian community to realize that this is the plan. And uh, even the Balfour Declaration did not steer, when it was adopted in November 1917, did not steer yet the public in Palestine to revolt against the British policy or the Zionist strategy. But by 1936, you can already see the beginning of the real results of this strategy. Uh, Palestinians are evicted from land purchased by the Zionist uh, movement. Uh, Palestinians lose jobs because of a Zionist strategy to take over the labor market. And uh, it was very clear that Europe is going to, or the Jewish problem of Europe, is going to be solved in Palestine. And all these uh, uh, three factors pushed the Palestinians for the first time to say, we have to do something about it. And they tried to revolt. And you needed the whole might of the British Empire to crash that revolt, as it did happen. Uh, it took them three years, and they used the repertoire of... Uh, uh, actions against the Palestinians that were as bad as those that would use would be used later on by the Israelis to quell the uh, Israeli uh, the, the Palestinian Intifada of 1987 and that of uh, 2000. And and this revolt of, of 36 was a, a very popular revolt, right? Uh, it was uh, the Fala, right? The the peasants also that took arms, and um, and also uh, I think reading your books and and. I've realized that 
the squashing and the way this revolt was so violently squashed in a way helped in, in 48, to, you know, the, the Palestinian was that weak in 48 before, because all the leaders and all the potential, uh, you know, fighting elements had been killed or had to go into exile in, in 36. Absolutely. The, the Palestinian political elite lived in the cities of Palestine, but the main victims of Zionism up to the 1930s were in the countryside. And that's why the revolt started in the countryside. But there were sections of the urban elite that uh, joined them. And I th yes, indeed, I, I pointed out in one of my books that um, the British have killed or imprisoned uh, most of those who belong to the Palestinian political elite and military, or potentially military elite. So actually, they created um, a Palestinian society that was quite defenseless in 1947 when the first Zionist actions uh, with the knowledge that the British mandate came to an end have commenced, had commenced. And I think it had an impact on the inability of the Palestinians to resist uh, a year later, in 1948, the ethnic cleansing uh, of Palestine. And, and also, um, in, uh, I mean, your work as, uh, as an historian has permitted to, to destroy myth uh, about, about Israel. One of the myths is that Israel was created because the Bible gave it to the Jewish people. But I'd like you to tell us a bit about Theodor Herzl, that was, I mean, or is known as one of the founder of Zionism, who was not religious at all, right? And I think right. he didn't even, I mean, he didn't speak Yiddish or anything. That's, that's right. Um, Zionism had one element that is usually uh, forgotten by historians, and this was a wish to secularize uh, uh, Jewish life. And um, if you secularize the Jewish uh, religion, you cannot use later the Bible as a justification for uh, occupying Palestine. So it was a bizarre uh, um, mixture, which I like always to call that the, uh, it's a movement made by people who do not believe in God, but God nonetheless promised them uh, Palestine. And I think that is something that is at the heart of the internal problems of, of Israeli Jewish society uh, uh, today. But I think it's also important to understand that even before Herzl, there were people who thought about themselves as Zionists, but w were aware of the existence of Palestinians in, in Palestine, and were thinking of different kinds of connection to Palestine and, uh, so and solutions for the insecurity of Jews in Europe like Hadam, who said that maybe Palestine would be just a spiritual center and Jews, if they feel in, uh, insecure in Europe, should settle elsewhere outside of Europe or settle in more secure European societies. One important group of people that did not allow them in a way to do this were Christian Zionists that already existed in those days who believed that the return of the Jews to Palestine was part of a divine scheme and they wanted to the Jews to return to Palestine because it could precipitate the second coming of the Messiah. I think they were also anti-Semites. It was like a double bill. They could also get rid of the Jews of Europe at the same time. So I think it's, it's an important period to go back to, uh, to understand how British imperialism, Christian Zionism, and of course uh, Jewish nationalism played together as a formidable force that left very, chance, very few chances for the Palestinians when it uh, erupted eventually as uh, effects on the ground in the late 19th century. I guess you have to add to this anti-Semitism as well, right? That's what you said. Like yeah, yeah. When you hear Lord Balfour and, uh, and the, the, sort of the politicians at the time, they wanted the Jews to live in Palestine because they don't, didn't want the Jews to live in England or anywhere else in, in Europe. And, uh, and so... Yeah, history is crucial, and, and we've talked uh, a few hours ago about knowledge and the way knowledge is transmitted. And So can you tell us about this, about how history and how knowledge, if it's properly taught, can enlighten people and can maybe better the struggle? Yes, definitely. I, I think that uh, we've already pointed out to it that um, if you don't have an historical perspective and if you don't know uh, the facts and you don't have an historical understanding, you uh, uh, accept the kind of negative uh, depictions 
that the world and the Israelis have on the Palestinians. We gave one example of what is so-called uh, Palestinian terrorism, that in the Israeli perspective and in some Western perspective comes out of the blue. We don't know why these people are violent. Maybe it's because they're Muslims, maybe it's their political culture. And it's only when you have an historical understanding you say, wait a minute, I understand where this violence comes from. I understand the source of the violence. And then you come and say, actually settling in my house by force is an act of violence. Maybe I was wrong, maybe I was right to try and resist it by violence, but it begins by the very invasion of my uh, space and the place where I live. And when this invasion is accompanied by a wish to get rid of me, what else can I, what else can I do? So I think that the, this historical dimension is important first for a better understanding for why the conflict continues. The second reason is that we will never succeed in changing political views about the Palestine issue if we won't explain to people how knowledge was manipulated. It's very important because uh, you need to understand how certain words are being used, like the peace process, how certain ideas are being broadcast, like uh, the only democracy in, in the Middle East, like uh, Palestinian primitivism, and so on. You need to understand how these languages uh, are means of manipulating the knowledge that is there so as to form a certain point of view and to prevent another point of view from coming uh, into into the space. So I think it's, it's a double bill uh, in a way. You need to understand the history of the place, but you also have to understand the power of narratives, uh, how they are being uh, constructed and how they are being manipulated and how uh, they can be challenged. And the main narrative that the Israelis still succeed in portraying is this idea of almost uh, a land that even if it's not was not empty, it was full of people who have no real connection to the place. And and they lose always they lose legitimacy. They lose one's legitimacy because they're not there. Then they lose legitimacy because they are a bit of Bedouins and nomads, so they don't really care. Then they lose the legitimacy by being violent. Uh, or by being Muslims after 9-11. I mean, there's all the time this m machine uh, or launderette of words and ideas tries to convince you that whatever the Israelis are doing, if you're not happy, unhappy with this, it doesn't matter because there's no one there on the other side that really has anything legitimate to offer. So it's, it all depends on Israeli kindness. If you, if you check very carefully the language of peace since Oslo, uh, even before, but it's more uh, accentuates, accentuated since Oslo. It's all about Israeli concessions. The language is concessions. Israelis will make concessions to the Palestinians, and then there's a chance for peace. Um, if this is the departure point, there will never be any reconciliation. Uh, I'll, I, I invaded your house, but I'm generous enough to let you come back and take the sofa with you to the new place. Uh, this is hardly a dialogue that wants to resettle a conflict. It is uh, almost more humiliating than the act of invasion uh, itself. But um, history is subjective, right? Or at least historians are subjective. Yeah. For example, how can, uh, I mean, you yourself and Benny Morris, for example, agree on the facts of 48 and 47, right. uh, but you come to very different conclusions. So how do you, how do you deal with that? First of all, I think there is a factual infrastructure. We all have to know it. And uh, in this respect, it's good that Benny Morris at least uh, added to the fray, so to speak, uh, this idea that you should stop the nonsense of saying that the Palestinian left voluntarily in 1948. So this was a factual debate. Did they leave voluntarily or were they expelled? But what you feel from this debate when it continues that this is not the most important issue, because even before the new historians appeared in Israel, we knew that Palestinians were expelled. It just we didn't believe the Palestinians. There were, there were five million Palestinian refugees who kept telling us we were expelled. And we said, no, no, you are Palestinians. When you say it, we don't believe you. 
Uh, only when the Israeli historians came and said, you know what, they're right. We found some documents that say that they're right. Then suddenly they were uh, telling the truth. But this was only a first step. The most important thing is not what happened, but how, what do we learn from what happened? What, is our, what are our conclusions? And this is a moral debate. It's an ideological debate. The artificial attempt to say that the historians can deal only with what happened and not say anything about what the implications are, uh, uh, the, the false uh, approach in this can be seen from Morris's own work. He writes one book in which he is a bit sorry for what has been done in 19. 48. This is his first book. And his last book, he's sorry that the Israelis did not complete the ethnic cleansing. So he hasn't changed one fact in both books. It's the same facts, but the books are being rightly read very differently. Uh, one book uh, does not like the idea of an ethnic cleansing. The other book uh, endorses it, not only uh, justifies it in the past, but endorses it as a plan uh, for the future. Um, <clears throat> it's gonna be time to uh, take a little musical break, guys. Um, Ilan, you've uh, chosen two tracks, if I'm not That's mistaken, right. uh, that you wanted to listen to. Could you uh, introduce the first one to us and maybe tell us the reasons why you've chosen this one? Yes. Uh, the first track is a song by uh, Cat Stevens called The uh, uh, Peace Train. Um, I always loved uh, uh, Cat Stevens. I'm, I'm a product of the 70s and uh, he was one of my musical heroes. Uh, I also like the, uh, his very bold move by converting to, to, to Islam and not being terrified by everything that was said about him. And I think there's some honesty in, in this guy. And uh, this uh, song for me was uh, uh, encapsulating, although I'm not sure he meant the same thing that I mean in it, but that doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> uh, encapsulates for me what I was always longing for, to have this... Uh, peace train coming to, to Israel and Palestine. Uh, and I always understand that uh, you, you have to understand who is the driver, who are the passengers. And I, I wrote, I don't remember in which, which of my articles, but in one of my articles I wrote there's a difference between a peace train that takes us all to a better destination, which is the peace process which we don't have, and the peace train that uh, runs over everyone on the way to the so-called peace, which I think is our present peace process. So it's a very powerful metaphor for me, the peace train. Thank you very much. We're listening to uh, Kat Stevens, and we're coming back just after that. Okay, ready? Mm. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, welcome back. You're still listening to Le Mur à des Oreilles, The World Has Ears, and we are talking with Ilan Pape. Uh, before the musical break, we talked about uh, history, and uh, we are now going to uh, talk about the present. And uh, I think, Frank, you uh, wanted to... Yes, because obviously history is nice, and we talk about history, but we do, unfortunately, maybe live in the present. Yeah. And, um, and we have to... Uh, uh, I know. I mean, Flo said uh, at the Florent, sorry, said at the beginning that you've moved uh, to uh, to Exeter in the UK. In, was it 2007 or 2008? In 2007. Did you move to the UK because of the Balfour Declaration? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But uh, yeah, I didn't think about it. It's quite symbolic, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but still, yeah, you moved to the UK uh, a few years ago. But you you do travel back and forth to Israel, uh, where your family is based very often. What um, on the ground in Israel, and in terms of not the Palestinian, but the Israeli society itself, how do you see it change? Uh, can you, do you see positive changes? Do you see negative changes? Do you s what type of difference you know, in the last few years has, has happened? I think what I see is how uh, formidable is the task of uh, changing this, the Jewish society from within. It uh, seems to be more and more entrenched in its uh, positions and it... Uh, the more, the more I'm thinking about it, the more, in a way, a bit desperate I am about the options of changing it from within. On the other side, there is a growing number of young people who seem to grasp reality in a different way. Now, they're very few and are not uh, large in numbers, but I don't remember uh, having such a younger generation before in Israel. So I think, uh, although the uh, short-term uh, future does not 
uh, harbor any chance for change from within the Israeli Jewish society, uh, there is a signs that with pressure from the outside, from all kinds of things that maybe we cannot even know, there is a group of people there with whom one would be able in the future maybe to create a different kind of society. But if you compare Israel today to the Israel I, I left, for instance, or the Israel I grew in, uh, the trend is to become even more chauvinistic, ethnocentric, uh, uh, intransigent, uh, introverted. I mean, all these bad uh, positions that make us all feel that peace and reconciliation is so far away if we only rely on our hope that the Jewish society will change uh, from within. So, I mean, you've partly answered, but how, how do we change this? Uh, do you, some people say the, ch the change need, needs to come from inside as well, and uh, you need to convince Israelis or the majority of Israelis that mm -hmm. the way things are going are not, um, are not for, even for their own, they're not good for their own benefit. But um, some people say we've talked enough with Israelis. It's been more than 60 years or since Oslo of talk, of, and, and nothing has happened, nothing good has happened on the ground for the Palestinians. So w what's your view on this? Is, it, is that, does it have to be a, m a mix of both? Or, or do you think, you know, we should, you know, put all our energy on focusing from applying pressure from the outside? Yes, I, I think the reason we are all debating this is because on the ground, uh, the um, machinery of destruction does not stop for one day. And therefore, you don't have the luxury to say, or maybe it will take longer, but eventually, uh, you know, with the right circumstances, I would be able to achieve more in the f realm of uh, changing people's view from the inside. But we know that while we wait, there are so many terrible things are happening. And we know also there is a correlation between the terrible things that happen and uh, the realization of the Israelis government and people alike, that there is a price tag attached to what they're doing. If they would feel that there's no price at all, they would even accelerate more their, I think, their strategy uh, for cleansing Palestine altogether. So I think it's a mixture in the sense, in the sense that you ha urgently need to find a system by which at least you want to stop what is being done now not so much uh, change all the past evils, but just to stop what's going on and to prevent what is about to happen. And for that, you need uh, a powerful model of pressure from the outside. Uh, and uh, I think in many ways, the model that activism in the world and activism in Palestine has found, the BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction, is a good model. But it cannot be the only model. There, there are two, um, or it's not cannot be the only factor. There are two additional factors which are very important to make it a successful process. One is on the Palestinian side. I mean, the fragmentations for so many years have left the question of representation in Palestine open, and that's not good. You need uh, a good solution for that question. And secondly, you have to have a kind of an educational system inside that takes the time, works not under pressure, uh, that does want to educate the Israeli Jews about a different reality, about the benefits of a different reality, and so on. And I think if these things are combined together, you have an authentic Palestinian representation, you have strong pressure from the outside, and you have the beginning of a good a system that tries to educate people from the inside, then it's not even a matter of having both. It's just having everything in place to have a more holistic approach to uh, a reconciliation eventually. So uh, you being a teacher, w won't you be more useful teaching in Israel than in the UK? I don't know. Could you be the teacher you are in the UK in Israel? I, I don't think I want to be a teacher in the university anyway. So I don't think that university is a place where you teach people about the facts of life or you change their point of view. I think university became... Uh, anyway, uh, sites for careers, not for, for, for knowledge or education. So I would, I'm, I'm teaching in Israel as well in my own way, uh, whether I do it through 
uh, articles, uh, if I'm allowed, I'm not allowed that much to speak, but when I can speak, I speak. Um, and I would like to continue this. Uh, in fact, what I feel I'm doing in Britain is actually working more on the, uh, the other side of this activism, the pressure from the outside, and less about education. Although, in order to, you cannot just maintain a, a BDS campaign without explaining to people in Britain and elsewhere why this is legitimate and why is it necessary. So I think we don't cease to be educators as well as activists all the time. It's just uh, trying to combine the right uh, measure between uh, the action that you take and the amount of time you spend in explaining why you are doing what you do and not to be impatient if people don't understand what you're doing, so you have to find the space and time to explain again until they, are, they can see uh, your point of view. And um, to go back of the, um, in, uh, to go back to the question, to the point you addressed just before, the point of representation and Palestinian uh, representativity, I think I'm, I'm very interested in this question of solidarity. People often will say, if you are not Palestinian or if you are not Uh, Israeli, uh, you, your role is to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. But what solidarity means, and what in solidarity with whom? Because there's no, rep, you know, proper representation. So, do you stand in solidarity with the Palestinian Authority? Do you stand in solidarity with with Hamas? Do you stand in solidarity with the whole Palestinian people that so far don't have any representation? And um, Because I'm always uh, thinking, like, okay, if my job is solely to stand in solidarity with whatever it means, the Palestinian people, what about if they decide that they want a state on 11% of historical Palestine and they want a neoliberal state? Yeah. Am I, am I, you know, is it compulsory for me then to still stand in solidarity with that? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a good question. But I think, first of all, the solidarity is with the victims of a certain policy and ideology, even if these victims are not represented, your solidarity is with their, with their suffering, and your support is with their attempt to get out of this suffering. Now, you raised an interesting question. What happens if you think that what they're doing is not going to get them out of this misery? I think part of solidarity is like, uh, is like uh, a good friendship. Part of your job as a good friend is to tell your friend, I think, I understand what you're doing, but I think you're wrong. And uh, we find ourselves, uh, those of us who are with, in solidarity with the Palestinian people, when it comes to our debates with good friends of us, of ours, in, on the Palestinian side who support the two-state solution or still support the peace process. Uh, I think it's part of our role uh, and our just role as people who are part of a solidarity movement is to tell them, we think you're wrong. Um, you, cre you painted a, a theoretical uh, situation by which there's not even one Palestinian who would agree with you. I don't think that this is realistic. But uh, if that happens, then maybe, yes, we have to rethink the whole idea. But I, I don't think we invent debates. These are organic to the situation, namely, If you have a position between one state to two states or what kinds of means the Palestinians should adopt, you connect to debates that the Palestinians have themselves. So you're not really outside that debate. You're not offering something that they're not thinking about themselves. And you are absolutely, I think that you would be betraying your solidarity if you want to have a position on the kinds of debates uh, that are being taken. Uh, I know there is a nationalistic uh, attitude sometimes saying that you're not entitled to do this and so on. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, movements are made of people and people are different from each other. And uh, uh, not everybody would uh, play according to the same rules of the game. But I think solidarity is also agreeing on, on what is... Um, right to do and what is wrong to do? Wh what are the boundaries of the in involvement of people from the outside? And uh, I think there is no dogmatic answer to this. And um, usually when someone flaunts it, when someone says, uh, you know, uh, you have no right to say to me that, I, that you are for one state if you're not a Palestinian or Israeli Jew, it's usually to stifle 
a debate or not to uh, not to to want to to listen to a different point of view. So I I think that uh, we should not waste too much time on this question. Uh, uh, by now, I think everyone involved knows what solidarity means and what it entitles you to do and what it doesn't entitle you to do, uh, even before the issue of representation uh, was solved. You've touched upon the pretty eternal debate of the two states, uh, one state, binational state uh, solution, what people call, call it a solution. But in fact, when you look at, at what's happening and when you look at the facts, there's not really a debate, right? I mean, the two-state solution is still nowadays adopted by all the institutions, you know, the, Europe, the Europeans, the, the states, and the major countries in Western Europe. While, as soon as you mention one state, people go, you, need, you know, it's utopia. You, they never live together. They hate each other. So... But again, is it like, aren't we facing again with some sort of cognitive dissonance, even from the side of the Palestinians that still today uh, support the Oslo peace process or support Oslo? Um, I've, I've heard people that, uh, I mean, Edward Said, for example, was saying, you didn't have to be a genius, just read Oslo and read the, you know, the, the document. And, and you'll see that it was bound, actually not to fail, it was bound to succeed for, for Israel, to bring Israel with a, a proxy army in the West Bank, etc. But still nowadays, you've got Palestinians and, and politicians that defend Oslo and just said it failed because uh, Itzhak Rabin, a pacifist, so it's still called a pacifist, died, and then the right wing took over. But um, the question of one state, which uh, humanely has to be the more logical it's not really, uh, I mean, it is more and more, I guess, in, in the mainstream media, but still, there's not, the work is not being done to educate people on what's possible with, with, a, with a common state. Yes, I, I think two things happened here. One is that the, because the Palestinian representation issue is still open, uh, the people who claim to represent the people of the West Bank became the Palestinian representation. Now, from the perspective of someone who lives in the West Bank, one can see the attraction of the two-state solution. It can mean the end of military control in their life, and uh, one can understand the wish to see the back of the Israeli soldiers as soon as possible. Uh, but it, of course, uh, disregards uh, the other Palestinian uh, groups and their uh, uh, difficulties and agendas. And even when they don't regard them, it comes back to haunt them, as happened in Oslo, where neither Arafat nor Abu Mazen could really go the extra mile to sign with the Israelis because he could not, both of them could not forget the Palestinian refugees, even if they tend to uh, totally ignore the Palestinians inside uh, Israel. Um, so that's one thing, that, and I think that's one of the difficulties, that you have a certain group of Palestinians who, to my mind, wrongly, but at least one can understand why, believes that this is the quickest way of ending the occupation. I don't think it is, I think, as you rightly say, as Edward Said said, the Oslo Agreement was an agreement to ensure the continuation of the occupation, not the termination of the occupation. The second reason is that, and that's very surprising, but uh, for some reason, the two-state solution, because it has a logical ring to it, uh, it's a very Western idea, this idea of uh, uh, partition. It's an, uh, a colonialist invention that worked in India and in Africa, the idea that you partition, whereas the non-Western world is a far more holistic world. But it's very interesting. became a kind of a religion, uh, to the extent that you don't question it anymore. You just work out how best to get there. And that is surprising. That, and that, to my mind, it makes very intelligent people uh, even uh, err in this respect because they treat it as a kind of a, a religious logic, if you want, or, the log or religion of logic, rather, or reason, uh, as if this is the most enlightened way of looking at reality. And uh, if you question it, then you question modernism, you question rationality, and so on. And I think that um, this is why uh, a lot of people in the West would still stick to it. And um, nothing on the ground would ever change their mind. Of course you're right. Five minutes on the ground shows you 
that the one-state solution is already there, but it has a regime which is almost in certain areas like an apartheid regime, and in other, it's a non-democratic regime. So you don't need to think about a two-state solution. You need to think how you can change the relationship between the two communities within the one state that is already there operating since uh, 1967. Th there's one thing I've, I've, I've tried to understand and I've read about and I've watched uh, speeches about and, and presentations about uh, very intelligent people like Noam Chomsky, uh, Norman Filkenstein, say that the two-state solution is the step, the, the compulsory step towards something better. Uh, I went to a lecture by Norman Filkenstein, who he, he told me before the lecture, I will explain in this lecture how we do it. I went to the lecture and I still don't understand mm -hmm. how this can be done, going to two-state, and how do you get to a two-state now, I still don't really get it, to then go to a one state or a, f a federation of states. Do you see this? How, how does the step yes, work? It, it's, again, it comes back to a rationalist Western way of looking at reality. In a rationalist way, you say, I can only do what is possible. I am not allowed to think of what I want. I can only think about what I can get. So at this moment of time, it seems that you have such a wide coalition for the two-state solution, so you take it. You don't evaluate, which is very strange. You don't evaluate its morality, its ethical dimension, uh, even if it's potential to change the reality later on. Uh, for me, it's like the Jewish joke that you, you, it's like someone who looks for a key they have lost, not, with the, not where they lost the key, but where there is light. So uh, the two states is the light, it's not the key. There is light, so let's go to the light. That, there's, that the, you have lost the key somewhere else is not important because there's a lot of light, so you can see very well the terrain. Uh, and I think that has to do with enlightenment, uh, this whole idea that this is a very uh, reasonable uh, approach. Of course, it's, it's reasonable to a point, but it's totally insane because it has nothing to do with the conflict. It really has nothing to do with the conflict. The, it has to do with the way that Israel wants the world to accept its idea that um, already was constructed in 1967, that it needs most of the territory it occupied in 67, but it is willing to allow some autonomy to the Palestinians in that territory. The debates in Israel is how much autonomy, how much space, but not about the principle. And the only thing the Israelis always needed was an international support. At first, they thought they needed an international support and a Jordanian support because the land used to be part of Jordan. Then in 1988, Hussein disappointed them and said, no, I'm not part of it. It's between you and the Palestinians. So the Israelis said, okay. So we need uh, uh, affirmation for our policy from the international community and a Palestinian representative. They looked for a local Palestinian representative. They couldn't find one. So in 1993, they were willing to allow the PLO, which surprised them, I think, when it said, okay, you have, as they understood it, you have our affirmation. We are happy to have a small autonomous areas in the West Bank, and you can have the rest, both in terms of space and in terms of control. And that's the two-state solution uh, that everybody wants to convince us is the only way forward. Now, there isn't one Palestinian who can live with this reality, and therefore the conflict enrages and continues even with uh, greater force, potentially at least, uh, in the future. I'll end with, um, with a question on, uh, on someone that died 10 years ago uh, now, uh, Edward Said, uh, Palestinian thinker, philosopher, teacher, uh, musician. He, he was one of the last Palestinian with Mahmoud Darwish, who also died, that really for, was someone that Palestinian could look up to. He wasn't part of really, uh, I mean he was, but he wasn't really part of any political parties. And he right. was someone that they really could look up to for inspiration. And, uh, and I know you, you knew him well, and yes. uh, he had great things to say about you uh, as well. I, I read one of his books where he mentioned you and, and your relationship. Um, so can, you, can we end with you uh, giving us a few words on, on Edward Said and, and his role? 
Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, we, we miss him very much, as you say. I don't think only Palestinians looked uh, uh, at him for inspiration. I think he was one of the greatest uh, intellectuals uh, in the first half uh, and until he died uh, in the second half of uh, the 20th century. I'm sorry, in the second half of the 20th century. So we all looked uh, at him for inspiration, not only in the issue of Palestine, but on questions of knowledge and morality and, and, and activism. Uh, uh, so we, we, uh, he left a hole, uh, uh, not only among Palestinians. Uh, I think what we are missing is, again, I come to this holistic approach. I think we are missing his ability to see things uh, uh, from above in a more wholesome way. Uh, and and uh, when you don't have someone like that, then you have people who are taking the fragmentation that Israel imposed on the Palestinians and make it as if this is not going to change, as, as this is a reality itself. What we need, I think that would be the best legacy. What we need is to overcome the intellectual, the physical, and the cultural fragmentation that Israel imposed on us, Palestinians and Jews, and to strive to come back to something far more holistic, something far more organic and integrated, so that the third generation of Jewish settlers and the indigenous native people of Palestine could have a, a future together as he hoped uh, we all would have. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, Hilan, uh, have you got a new book out, or are you working on one book? I'm working on several books. Uh, one of them is coming out uh, next uh, uh, winter, in the coming winter. It's called The Idea of Israel uh, with Verso. It's a history of uh, knowledge production in Israel. I try to show how the Israelis uh, marketed the idea of Israel inside and outside, and why is it so difficult to challenge it. Uh, from within. And in 2015, my book on the history of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank would come out, which will call, be called the Mega Prison uh, of Palestine. So these are the two books. Okay, that's great. Uh, all the best with that. And uh, let's hope that uh, we'll soon see an end to Palestinian sufferings and to uh, Israel's impunity. Uh, thank you, Frank. You've been great again. Um, Thank you, Jeanne, for taking care of the technical uh, aspect of this program today. Uh, don't forget to check out our website, lemuradesoreilles.org, where you can find um, numerous exclusive interviews with such uh, inspirational minds as Noam Chomsky, Ken Loach, Saleh Bakri, Heyal Sivan, Hani Abu Assad, and more. You also can find uh, all our, our hour-long conversations there with uh, François Dubuisson, Anne Pack, Rafif Ziada, and this one with Ilan Pape. Uh, before we go, um, Ilan, could you tell us the second song you've uh, chosen to uh, share with us? And uh, again, why you picked this song? I picked the song Comandante Che Guevara, uh, uh, which uh, for me was a song that uh, always tied me into uh, activism that went beyond Israel and Palestine into something that always moved me, the, the, the ability of people to put aside their life uh, and activities for the sake of oppressed people, wherever they are. And I think Che Guevara was a very impressive uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, figure in this. It also reminded me of a very uh, uh, exciting trip I had to Cuba, uh, where I met uh, Fidel Castro and... Uh, 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 and I was in Santa Clara there, and um, uh, the uh, particular performance or version of the song that is performed by Dolores, the Greek uh, singer, is for me in particular moving, and I, I, I really feel it keeps me on my toes as an old, an old revolutionary now. Uh, I want to remain young, and this song uh, makes me <laughs> feel younger. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's a great song to live with, um, uh, marching and singing towards uh, victory. Hasta la victoria siempre. Thanks again. Thank you, Frank. And uh, Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thank bye, you bye. Bye. bye bye. Bye bye. <coughs> 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 <coughs>